everyone, I am Jacob Lackner, and it's Thursday, so that means it's time for a history video. This week, I'm doing a topic that the viewers voted for. I'm giving my picks for the 10 most influential scientists of the Middle Ages. Now, you might be under the impression that science didn't really exist during the medieval period, and you wouldn't be entirely wrong to say that. Science as we think of it today was born during the Scientific Revolution, which began with Nicolaus Copernicus's publication of On the Revolution of Celestial Spheres in 1543. This work was revolutionary because it refuted the work of classical scientists, which most people before Copernicus just took at face value. People like Aristotle claim that the Earth was at the center of the universe, but Copernicus used his own observations and analysis to prove that wasn't the case at all. His work marked the beginning of a major change in the ways in which scientists operated. As a result of the printing press, his work spread throughout Europe and influenced many people. And now, scientists use their own observations and experiments to test hypotheses. That said, Copernicus wasn't the first person to do this sort of thing since the ancient world. As is the case with most revolutions, this change didn't just explode out of nowhere. Copernicus was building upon a foundation that had been laid in medieval Europe. The Middle Ages saw individuals make scientific contributions, and while experimentation and the like wasn't entirely common, there are some people who were outliers and whose work was sort of before its time, since pursuing knowledge in this way was by no means something everyone was doing. So, while Copernicus did set in motion a process wherein everyone starts doing things his way, doing observations to disprove or prove hypotheses, there were medieval scientists doing the same thing, but they were doing it in an isolated way. Their way of doing things didn't spread throughout Europe the way it would with the beginning of the scientific revolution. And that's what makes these medieval scientists different from Copernicus. Still, I do think we can call medieval individuals scientists when they recorded their own observations about things and refuted the work of classical thinkers, especially when they ended up being right about stuff in the long run. I focused on Europe for this list because I think it is much more common knowledge that there were several highly influential scientists in the Islamic world at this time. All right, with that introduction out of the way, let's dive into the 10 most influential medieval scientists. At number 10, I have St. Bede the Venerable. Bede was an English Benedictine monk. He's the first of several monks and other clergy that we will see on this list. Many medieval scientists were religious people, and they saw what they did as uncovering the mysteries of God's creation. And that's true of Bede and most of the others on this list. He's most well known for writing his Ecclesiastical History of the English People, as well as for his introduction of the AD and BC dating system. But in addition to his historical and theological works, he was also very interested in examining and explaining the natural world. In his book, De Temporum Ratione, or On the Reckoning of Time, the same work where he introduces his dating system that I just mentioned, he also spends a considerable amount of time discussing his observations of the movement of the moon and the effect that it seemed to have on tides. Classical thinkers had suggested that tides were the result of water being absorbed into and released from the earth, and this was widely accepted. This made him the first person to suggest the moon somehow exerted force on the Earth, a force that we now call gravity. He was doing the same kind of thing Copernicus did almost 1,000 years earlier, since he was refuting classical thinkers based on his own detailed observations. At number 9, I have William of Ockham. Like Bede, he was an English monk, but he lived several centuries later, and he was a Franciscan rather than a Benedictine. William of Ockham is a significant figure in the history of religion in Europe because he was one of the first to challenge the authority of the papacy, and his work would be read by Martin Luther a few centuries later. However, he also made an important contribution to science, especially when it came to reasoning, experimentation, and observation. Of the people on this list, he may actually be the most well-known, at least you'll be familiar with his name, since his discussion of these things has been summarized as Occam's Razor, a phrase you still hear people use today. And this term Occam's Razor refers to his suggestion that if one is making an observation, you should consider what the simplest explanation is, rather than just trusting authoritative classical sources. The fact that this term is still used today when it comes to reasoning and science is a good indicator of how influential he was. At number 8, I have Trota of Salerno. If you've watched my video on the 10 most influential women of the Middle Ages, you've already heard me talk about her some. She is the first of several physicians on this list, and the only woman to make the list. Medicine is arguably the area in which medieval scientists contributed the most. Trota was a 12th century Italian physician who wrote two major works on medicine. She composed her own medical texts, something that other physicians weren't yet doing. In particular, Trota seems to have been an expert in gynecology and obstetrics. She was probably the first medieval physician to start to challenge some of the medical ideas of antiquity. Most medieval physicians, both Jewish and Christian ones, largely accepted the ideas of the ancient physicians like Galen and Hippocrates and treated them like gospel. 
Most medieval people saw the authority of these ancient doctors as absolute and didn't feel the need to do things like record their own observations and how they related to ancient medical ideas. They just didn't feel they had anything to add. Trota, though, pointed out some instances where she knew the work of ancient physicians was just wrong based on her own observations. She is also notable for being the first person to compose an entire work that was about gynecological disorders, De Curis Mulierum, and in it she described several diseases for the first time, like endometriosis. While others had written books that contained some information on this subject, Trota was the first to focus on an exhaustive discussion of such disorders, all in a single work, and based upon her own observations. Her works were widely circulated throughout the Middle Ages, and once universities began to emerge, Italy became one of the centers for studying medicine, and her various books were required reading, giving her a lasting influence on medicine. All of the other physicians that we'll see on this list all studied Trota. At number seven, I have Frederick II, who was the Holy Roman Emperor between 1220 and 1250. He was one of the most powerful people in all of Europe and got a whole lot done in that capacity. To sum some of them up, his Sixth Crusade helped recapture Jerusalem after it had been lost for decades, and he sought to conquer much of Italy. For us, the thing that makes Frederick II so important was that he was a skeptic who basically didn't believe anything if he couldn't witness it himself. This led him to doubt a whole lot of things that were considered authoritative. To connect him to one of my other videos, he didn't believe at all that the barnacle goose and the goose barnacle were the same animal. I'm not going to go deep on that in this video, since I did it elsewhere, but suffice it to say, he sent a hunting party north to capture a barnacle goose and collect a goose barnacle just so he could dissect and examine them himself, and after he did, he concluded that they were completely different animals. He also had a great interest in falconry, in other words, using birds to help you hunt, and he wrote a handbook about it called The Art of Falconry. It contained a lot of his observations on how best to train and treat birds of prey to help you with hunting, and he doesn't just make assertions, he talks about what his actions were and the results were. He was a rather cold and calculating person who didn't often place much value on human life, and sometimes his pseudo-experiments, let's call them, reflect this. For example, he wanted to know what language people would speak if they never heard another language. To test this, he dropped a woman who was deaf and could not speak on an island with a baby, and planned to come back in a few years to see what language the child would be speaking. Unsurprisingly, when he returned to the island, they were nowhere to be found, and his experiment failed. That's just one example. There is enough material about Frederick's sadistic science experiments that it could be a topic for an entire video. And while these sorts of things are absolutely horrible, it does indicate the kind of inquisitive mind he had when wanting to test hypotheses and theories. His skepticism and need to investigate and observe also ended up being really good news for Jews in the Holy Roman Empire, because in 1235 a case of blood libel was brought against the Jews of Fulda, and more than 30 Jews were executed in the city as a result. This was an accusation that Jews ritually murdered a Christian child and had their blood cooked into the Passover matzah. The dead child was brought to his court, and Frederick, in a council he appointed, went about what we would call today a forensic investigation, and ultimately concluded that the way the child died was not consistent with the accusation. His blood hadn't been drained, and it appeared he had died from blunt force trauma, not from crucifixion, as was claimed. He had those who had accused the Jews and wasted his time of treason, and they were executed. Frederick was really before his time when it came to being skeptical and trying to test everything. On a related note, he was also hugely skeptical of Christianity, and this often got him into trouble with the church. At number six, I have another individual who wielded a great deal of power, in addition to making some scientific contributions, and that's Pope Sylvester II. Before he became Pope, his name was Gerbet of Aurillac. He was educated in Spain, a place where there was a great deal of Muslim influence, and this brought him directly into contact with some important advancements in science and mathematics that would be incredibly important going forward. He had a great deal of respect for Islamic culture, and he found that the way they did many things when it came to numbers and calculations and science was way better than what was going on in the rest of Europe. Once he became Pope, he used his position of power to really reform science and mathematics. He introduced the abacus and the armillary sphere into Europe, which were helpful for mathematics and navigation, respectively. Probably most important, he introduced what are often called Arabic numerals into European society. This is the same numerical system we utilize today. This numerical system actually originally came from India, but when there was Islamic conquest in that region, they adopted it and it spread throughout the Islamic world, including into Spain. Europeans were still using Roman numerals, which were very difficult for actually doing any kind of math with, while Arabic numerals simplified the process. He wrote a few treatises of his own, such as one on geometry. 
While he didn't really have any big contributions that were his alone, his willingness to acknowledge the technological and scientific benefits of introducing a new numerical system that completely cast aside the classical one everyone was using was a big deal. At number five, I have William of Salicetto, another Italian physician. He was a professor of medicine at the University of Bologna, which was the premier medieval university for medical study. It also put him in a great position to change medicine, since people he was training would become physicians. I want to focus on two things that he did. Firstly, he rejected humor theory. This was the core theory that had governed medical care since the time of the ancient Greeks, which stated that there were four types of substances in the human body, blood, pus, bile, and phlegm, and if they got out of equilibrium, it made an individual sick both physically and mentally. While he didn't seek to disprove humor theory entirely, he did note that his own observations didn't line up with it. He noticed that any time he saw yellow bile, what we call pus today, was when things weren't going so well for a patient and a patient's condition was getting worse. And that means it's something that's not always present in the human body, it's something that the body produces when under stress. And basically he's noting the development of what we call infection today. He also made an important contribution to surgery. When it was performed before William, surgeons generally use heat to close the wounds they created, cauterizing the area. But William suggested using what we now call a scalpel and suggested sealing the wound with stitches instead as his own observations and surgical results indicated that this gave patients a much better prognosis. And number four, I have Theodoric Borgognoni, yet another Italian physician. He was a Dominican friar and the Bishop of Servia. He was a contemporary of William of Salicetto who built on his work. He wrote an incredibly detailed work on surgery, and in it he outlines the use of anesthesia and antiseptic practices which were intended to reduce infection. He also continued to challenge the idea that pus was a healthy thing, and he found that there was less pus and infection when he soaked the bandages in wine. For anesthesia, Theodoric soaked a sponge in narcotic drugs and had patients inhale, and this had an effect similar to modern anesthesia. Obviously enough, these are all surgical practices that we are very thankful for in modern medicine. At number three, I have Guy de Chauliac, yet another physician, but the last one to make the list. And he was French rather than Italian. He had the benefit of living a century later than Theodoric Borgognoni and William of Salicetto, and he continued to build on their work, writing his own work on surgery, which was the earliest European work to give a detailed description of several common medical practices today, in particular intubation, the use of sutures, and tracheotomies. In addition to surgical contributions, he is also notable for treating patients suffering from the Black Death, or what we call plague. When people got bubonic plague, it led to their lymph nodes getting absolutely massive, like the size of an apple, and Guy recorded his observations to see if he could discover any pattern related to these nodules. By the 1360s, he had realized that patients whose lymph nodes burst on their own had a much better prognosis than those whose lymph nodes did not. If a patient only had one swollen lymph node, he introduced the standard practice of lancing and draining it, and this was fairly effective. We know today that these swollen lymph nodes from plague are caused by a bacteria called Yersinia pestis. It sets up shop in one lymph node and multiplies, forcing it to become enlarged, before then spreading throughout the entire lymphatic system and repeating the process. So Guy's lancing of the lymph node prevented the spread of plague to other lymph nodes in the body, which ultimately could result in death. The contribution went a long way towards making subsequent plague outbreaks less severe. At number two, it is Roger Bacon, an English Franciscan friar. He made way too many scientific contributions for us to be able to talk about them all here. He wrote important works on optics, astronomy, alchemy, mathematics, zoology, and more. We're going to focus on his broader contributions to science, though, which is that he created something of a precursor to the scientific method and recorded it for posterity. Like many of the people on this list, he was skeptical of some of the work of classical scientists, and he began systematically recreating situations these scientists described to see if his observations would be the same. This is basically the principle of testing hypotheses, and while others did this, especially in the 13th century, he was the first to really record the results of these experiments, and the first to do so many in so many different fields. His greatest work is the Opus Magus, or The Greater Work, which contained treatises on all of these topics and is seen as the foundational text of experimental science. Interestingly, a few centuries later, another Englishman named Bacon, Sir Francis Bacon, would build on his work, noting the importance of inductive reasoning when pursuing knowledge. In other words, the use of observations and experiments. Sir Francis Bacon is often called the father of the scientific method, and if that's true, we can probably at least call Roger Bacon the grandfather of the scientific method. Of course, that would probably really confuse people into thinking these two men were actually related, and they weren't. They just have the same last name. 
And at number one, it is St. Albert of Cologne, a German-Dominican friar more commonly known as Albertus Magnus, or Albert the Great. He's one of very few historical figures who was not a ruler to have the great appended to his name, and for him, it's entirely a result of his intellectual pursuits, which I feel make him the most important scientist of medieval Europe. In addition to that honorific, he was also known in his own time as Doctor Expertus and Doctor Universalis. Basically, he was thought of as the smartest guy in the world by many, the Albert Einstein of his own time. And his titles continue today. In addition to being called Albert the Great, in 1941 he was made the patron saint of natural scientists, a title that I think is well deserved. So, what did this guy do to deserve all of this? Well, he's the closest thing to Copernicus before Copernicus. While Copernicus focused on the heavens, Albertus Magnus focused the most on zoology, a field which he is considered the father of. By the 13th century, medieval bestiaries were some of the most popular things around, and it drove Albert crazy that people used these as if they were composed of real knowledge and not containing an ample amount of folk tales. Much of the information in those texts was based on classical knowledge or just folk beliefs. So he set about creating a real bestiary by cataloging and examining animals himself. Albert was skeptical of Aristotle and others, and one quote that is often attributed to him, probably apocryphally, but still the quote does a good job of expressing his position, and that quote is, if someone wants to know how many claws a cat has, they look it up in Aristotle instead of looking at a cat. He decided to write an entire commentary on Aristotle's De Animalibus, or on animals, and it is basically him roasting Aristotle for being wrong about so many things. He didn't stop there either, and later in his life he wrote his own De Animalibus, intentionally using the same title Aristotle did, sort of looking to supersede Aristotle's text. In short, he provided the first of what we would call a scientific analysis of animals, not only describing them, but also trying to explain why they possess certain traits. While evolution was many, many years away, his work was a precursor to that of Darwin. He would look at an animal's environment and then examine their traits, and he figured out that animals have traits that are suited for their environment. While he didn't say that these were adaptations in the sense that he thought they changed over an extremely long period of time, he did realize that animals are adapted for their environment, and that's a pretty big deal. In addition to his zoological contributions, Albertus Magnus was also tasked with creating the educational curriculum for Dominicans, which involved a great deal of scientific study alongside theological study. For Albertus, these things were very much interconnected. Dominicans would go on to be the major natural scientists for the rest of the Middle Ages. He also made several contributions to other fields, like botany, astronomy, and mathematics, but his contributions to scientific education, as well as his zoological contributions, are by far the most impressive. So those are my picks for the 10 most influential medieval scientists. I do want to make a quick aside about Thomas Aquinas, since I think some people might feel he should be here, and I seriously considered him making the list, but I ultimately decided that for me, his work was more theological and philosophical than scientific, and while it is science adjacent, I decided to exclude him. If I were making a broader list about medieval thinkers, he would probably be number one or very close to it, but I didn't think he belonged on this list. Well, that does it for this video. If you enjoyed it, please like it and share it so that others can enjoy it too. If you want to see my future videos, subscribe and turn on notifications. And if you want to see some I've already done, including other historical top tens, you should see some playlists on your screen shortly. Thanks for watching.